All right, so we're going to look at reaction mechanisms here. And so when you look at an overall balanced equation, it gives us the, the results of the reaction. So here we see nitrogen dioxide plus carbon monoxide. When they mix together, we do get nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. But that doesn't really tell us what might be happening at the molecular level. And so there are several reactions that can occur in little baby steps, which we call elementary reactions. So when you look at this through your beginning stages of chemistry eyes, and even I, you know, when I look at this, it looks like there's two nitrogens here for nitrogen dioxide, but only one over there for nitrogen monoxide, as opposed to with the carbon monoxide, sorry, carbon monoxide going to carbon dioxide. So in your head, you're probably thinking, okay, these two particles collide, and an oxygen transfers from the NO2 over to the CO. And that makes reasonable sense, okay? And then if someone asked you to write a rate law for this, you know, looking at this reaction, you would say, okay, rate equals K, concentration of NO2, concentration of CO. And you're thinking, yay, life is good. That sounds pretty good. But how do we find rate laws? We always find them experimentally. And so when someone comes back and says, no, we ran an experiment, we varied the concentrations and got the rates, and we found that the rate for this reaction is actually equal to the, constant, or the rate law constant times the concentration of NO2 squared. And you're like, huh, how can that be? And so what we do is we create a reaction mechanism. We write a mechanism to propose how we believe this reaction is going to happen. Okay. And so this is what we believe is happening based on the fact that we have this rate law proven experimentally. So it appears that this reaction happens in two steps. Okay. First off, two nitrogen dioxide molecules collide and create the nitrogen monoxide product, but also this NO3 thing. And this NO3 thing is then reacting with the carbon monoxide to get to our other products, the carbon dioxide. And so you can see that when we add up these two elementary reactions, we get our overall reaction, okay? Because the NO3s cancel out, as do these NO2s, and so we have our overall reaction when we add it up. Nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide as my reactants, and then nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide as my products. Now this NO3 thing that is created and then removed is called an intermediate. And these intermediates kind of facilitate the reaction along. Okay, Without it, they, we wouldn't have the overall reaction. But these intermediates are not found in the overall reaction. They must cancel out. Typically, they cannot be isolated. But as technology has improved and our ability to detect things in the lab, it can be, they can be found to be proven to exist using spectrometry and other analysis tools. So let's look at this a little more, okay? Again, a reaction mechanism is a set of elementary reactions that when you put them together, together, they give us our net overall reaction. So AP could say, hey, here's a mechanism. What is the overall reaction? So this is the mechanism that we believe is happening when we are creating carbon tetrachloride from either methane or incompletely chlorinated methanes like chloroform. So essentially we want to put another Cl there to make carbon tetrachloride from this chloroform. So here's our mechanism. See if you can add these reaction, these three steps up and find out what the overall reaction. Pause the video and give that a shot. Hopefully this is what you found because the two Cl's made in the first step cancel out as does the CCL3 complex. So those are intermediates that are canceled out, and that leaves us with our overall net reaction looking like that. Now, when we look at elementary reactions, a lot of times we discuss their molecularity. 
how many reactants are involved in the elementary reaction. And so basically we look at these three. We have a unimolecular elementary reaction because there's only one reactant molecule. We can have a bimolecular because there's two and perhaps a trimolecular or termolecular which is more often said if there are three. We never see four things colliding because again you know to get a reaction to go they have to collide with enough energy and in the proper orientation. So even termolecular are very 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 rare and typically only seen, the only ones that I've seen are when we're talking about reactions that are always in the gaseous phase. Because in the gaseous phase, the particles tend to have that enough energy, that activation energy, in order to react. So all we have to worry about is the orientation. So again, these are the, the molecularity of elementary reactions. And each elementary reaction can also have a rate law written for it. And so for a unimolecular, it would just be K times the concentration of the one reactant. For bimolecular, it's the concentration of the two reactants. And for elementary reactions, we can we are, can just use the coefficients. So we have two BRs plus the argon, so my rate law is K times the concentration of BR squared times argon. Okay, so again, when you are looking at an elementary reaction you can write the rate law directly from the little the balanced equation for the elementary reaction again our overall rate laws must be obtained experimentally okay and once we have an experimentally obtained rate law the mechanisms can be used to try to explain them okay and what this paragraph basically says is this is the scientific method in action Okay, you get a rate law from an experiment, and then you try to figure out how this reaction is happening. Now, someone might come along and have a different proposed mechanism, and that's totally fine. And until they're proven otherwise, they are both good. And some, as we'll see here, some mechanisms can be deemed better than others or more likely to happen. But if someone comes along and proves with technology or somehow that, you know, that intermediate doesn't exist, then you have to accept that fact and move on. But as it says here, you know, some of you might be doing research in this field because finding the dominant reaction pathway is a very central activity in chemistry. So maybe you will find yourself working on some kind of research project involving this. So let's kind of see it in action here. Here I have nitrogen dioxide reacting with fluorine. Experimentally it is found that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of NO2 concentration of F2. So it's a second order reaction, first order in respect to both of those reactants. When you first looked at that you might have assumed that you had two nitrogen dioxides colliding with fluorine and having it all happen in one step. But if that was the case my rate law would have looked like that where the concentration of nitrogen dioxide squared. This isn't the case. This does not agree with the experimentally determined rate law. So this is not how the reaction is occurring. Besides a term molecular process not very common even though everything's in the gaseous phase it's just not that common. Okay so there must be something else happening. So this is the proposed mechanism. The reaction is believed to occur in this way. First, nitrogen dioxide collides with fluorine, and then we create an intermediate here, this single fluorine, and that collides with NO2 and gets us our products. So notice here that we have a slow step and a fast step. Every time we have a mechanism, one of the steps is slow, and it is called the rate determining step because somehow we ended up with this rate law and so the mechanism tries to prove why that is such and so you'll see here that these two reactants in my slow step match the rate law that was found experimentally okay so that's what it says here the rate determining step is the slow step so you can write the rate law right from the elementary reaction 
and that slow step rate law always matches the experimental rate law always that's the purpose of these mechanisms of course it's chemistry so we're going to have a little exception every once in a while we'll come across a situation where the first step in the mechanism is deemed fast and in equilibrium <coughs> this is kind of common and it pops up on the AP exam quite often but what you see here is immediately following that fast equilibrium step we have our slow step our rate determining step okay so you see the mechanism and if they ask you to write the rate law you would say okay according to the rate law we've, I've got K times the concentration of my N2O2 times my concentration of my H2 but there's a problem here this N2O2 thing is an intermediate it is not in my overall reaction yay end of class so this is not possible for to be my rate law because the N2O2 is an inter intermediate I cannot have that in my reaction but you'll notice that this intermediate is in equilibrium with something that is in my overall reaction so we can do a little substitution since we have the equilibrium between the N2O2 and the 2NO then the concentrations are equal to each other concentration of N2O2 equals concentration of NO squared so I will just substitute this piece of information into my rate law and so I end up with this rate law K times the concentration of nitrogen monoxide squared times the concentration of hydrogen this is indeed confirmed experimentally because all of our rate laws come from experiments and so that's what we do again this is when we have our first step in our mechanism being deemed fast and at equilibrium and that has to be told to you all right the last thing here when we look at potential energy diagrams okay and we have our little hill of activation energy and stuff like that most of the ones that we've looked at do look like that because they occur in one fell swoop reactants to products reactions that have these mechanisms will end up having some bumpy that's a little exaggeration but we will see bumpy potential energy diagrams so here we see a reaction and we have the so yes here's our reaction and I can still ask all the lovely questions of this potential energy diagram like I used to like is this reaction exothermic and en or endothermic and you would hopefully answer exo since the products are at a lower energy position than the reactants I could still ask you you know what's the Delta H of this reaction so being exo you would hopefully answer that it's negative 130 kilojoules because that's the difference between the reactants and the products now you'll notice the three bumps okay so that's reflective of three steps in the mechanism okay so again how many steps are in the reaction mechanism depends on the humps which step in the mechanism is the rate determining one that's one is going to be the one that has the largest energy of activation so when you look at this first hill it appears to have the largest energy of activation so my rate determining step would be my first step in this mechanism real quickly again here's another one remember at the peaks of the hills we see the activated complexes the bottoms are where the intermediates exist okay so I have activation energy and then a, an intermediate is formed and then it disappears and then an intermediate is formed and then disappears okay so again this is a three-step mechanism because there's three humps but it appears this time that the second hump is the largest so I would say that the second step is the rate determining step all right I hope this helps and I will see you later